Well, listen, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Eric uh, and uh, I am part of the Accenture Strategy Group. And this, uh, this lecture is going to be eventually a little bit different than some of the other lectures you've seen. This is about AI in practice. Um, so it's really less about um, the technology of AI. So I'm not gonna go into the gory detail of AI. And frankly, I'm not qualified to either. Uh, although I have an engineering background, uh, I do not work on the specific mechanics of AI. So it's less about that. It's also, it's, it's less about the art of the possible for AI. So I'm not gonna go into kind of futuristic AI applications, although it could be fun. I mean, my background's in telco, so a lot of interesting stuff coming out of 5G applications coming out, but I'll probably uh, shelf that for this conversation. Uh, this is more about the art of the practical, uh, maybe not as sexy, but still exciting uh, nonetheless. Uh, but but this is about how to apply uh, intelligence, uh, apply to, uh, 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 applied intelligence, uh, which is Accenture's go-to-market strategy for AI and the combination of AI mixed with data, applications, uh, insights, analytics, and really how to generate value from, from all those. It's about you know enabling smarter technology, smarter applications um, to help your people work better, to be more efficient. It's about customer enhancements um, you know, and preferences for the customer. And so using AI applications for that. Uh, automation, end-to-end -end efficiencies in supply chain. Um, it's providing you know, what the development of technology is to run your operations in your business as well. Um, so you know, it all kind of en envelops into the transformation of a business. So whether it be a digital transformation, sales transformation, data transformation, it's how to use those in AI enablers uh, to do so. And so that's what this, this conversation is going to be about. And I'll try to keep it light uh, as much as I can. And it sounds like questions will be saved towards the end. Uh, and I'd be happy to answer any that you have. So I guess it would be best. I know uh, I did get an introduction, but let me just talk uh, a little bit about my background. Um, I am from the Accenture strategy practice, been there about seven years now. Um, my industry uh, background and my expertise sits in the communications and media. Uh, and more specifically, it is around telco, like I just mentioned. So when you think about telcos in the United States, we're talking about the Verizons, the AT&Ts, the Sprints, um, the, uh, you know, the T-Mobiles, uh, and then some of the what's called NBNO players. Uh, we don't have to get too much into that, but kind of the second tier telcos, so like the Spectrums, um, the Comcast, et cetera. And then you can shift over into the uh, actual internet service providers, which is the, you know, <clears throat> sorry, let me just turn off my phone. Uh, looking at the internet service providers like the Comcast and the uh, Charters and the Coxes. So we do work closely with them. And then I also work a little bit in the, um, uh, in the Akamai Amazon space, also in Google. And so you're thinking about AWS, so content delivery network. So I work in that space as well. Uh, but within that industry, my focus has been on analytics and that ranges from applied analytics. So going in quickly to a company using their existing data um, to kind of provide as quickly insights as you can. So very strategic focused analytics uh, to more transformative work where we're hoping to shift the company more to a data-driven culture um, uh, and, and provide a more digital transformation, which is in developing of getting them onto more digital applications. Uh, and those are larger scale projects where we you know, bring in more data scientists, data engineering, AI folks, kind of the whole suite of analytics to, uh, to help them make that transformation. Beyond that, I, I do do a lot of teaching. I do teaching at Accenture. Uh, part of their analytics learning lead. So we do a lot of learning at Accenture. So that's inside and outside of the practice, uh, teaching the clients and teaching our, 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 our own resources. Uh, and I also teach outside of Accenture. I am an adjunct professor at NYU uh, at the Management of Technology. So I do teach data visualization to the master's students. Uh, I also teach tech strategy or have taught, I'm not teaching it this semester, um, there. Prior to uh, NYU, I did teach at Columbia. They do have an applied analytics program uh, out of their masters, uh, out of the masters. So I did teach there and I just started a blog. So I'm gonna plug that one as well called Data Dabble and Design. I'm happy to shoot out the link where I provide you know, 
relevant, you know, different information from tutorials to kind of where I'm seeing analytics going, just my perspective. So that's another fun side thing. Uh, more personal level, I'm, you know, I'm from New York City. I live now in Boston, uh, and uh, you know, we're hunkered down here because of COVID. Been working from home, enjoying life with that. Have share an office with my wife and two kids and family. So there's been some positives there. Um, but we're hunkered down here out of Boston. So that's a little bit about me. <clears throat> so let's kind of get into AI, where AI is going. And this is starting off and going to be skewed, you know, giving the Accenture perspective, just because that's probably um, where I sit the closest. Um, but here is Accenture's perspective. So Accenture has, you know, they do a lot of these kind of larger scale CEO surveys where they talk to various CEOs at different C-suite levels and um, get their insights on what they think about varying topics. And they did that on AI, they do it on various other things. But the one on AI uh, was particularly interesting. And here's some numbers flashed in front of you. Uh, the three numbers, 84, 75, 76%, you know, without reading the text, it's, it's basically saying AI is super important to executives um, and they believe it's going to be important in the future, they believe it's going to be um, important to their growth objectives, and they believe that they're not fully equipped to get there. So there's this gap that they recognize. And then I think the bottom right number is the most interesting, and I can't believe we're already talking about 2025. We, we've been anchored so much on 2020 over the last five years, it's weird to now do the next. But 95% but of customer interactions are expected to be power through AI in the next five years, which is a daunting number given that it's a fraction of that today. And the you know, majority of interactions don't happen through AI. Customer interactions uh, still happen, you know, COVID, we'll have a slide on COVID. COVID is kind of a, a strange, this has happened. Uh, but prior to that, you know, most interactions still happen in stores and um, through customer service, et cetera. Um, and that shift is happening and it's being accelerated by COVID. Not to overwhelm you with data, but I think I'll, I think I'm going to. So the second one is, you know, another study. This was actually done by Deloitte, which is Accenture's competitor, but that's okay. These are all public, public surveys. Um, they came up with similar results, and they, they kind of took it another step. Where okay, so they know AI is important, um, but what what are some attributes to that that they're going to be focusing on? And so, an unsurprisingly, customer engagement. So self service which is a really cost reduction play, but a maybe in customer enablement play, so a growth strategy as well. So focusing on the customer as well as next best action tools. Uh, and for those not familiar with that, that is you know, more or less a tool that will help a representative or enable a customer representative provide the best service to the customer. So it's an AI tool that overlays on existing capabilities. Uh, and the third one is around advanced operational analytics. So a lot of these are around cost reduction plays, um, but I think you would you could really argue that AI is really a revenue generation and really a, a pivotal shift in, in how the business will transform. And so the immediate dollars are going to are going to cost reduction plays, but I think they'll soon shift into larger scale strategic board director conversations. And I think it already has been, and it's accelerating in that direction. So. Last slide on data, um, just to round out you know, where we were, where we are, what we think. Um, but it, I, it, I would be remiss if I don't talk about kind of the impact of COVID to AI and overall digital. Um, and I don't have to tell everyone here, we're nine months in, into a pandemic. Um, we've all felt the impact. We've all made adjustments to the way that we're consuming products or purchasing products and interacting with their businesses that we like and don't like, et cetera. Uh, but the truth is in the numbers. And so there's been a huge shift, uh, you know, starting on the left side here, this slide, there's been a huge shift across the globe in revenue generated from digital. Um, click to connect or what's called buy in line, pick up in store, which is really big in the US, particularly you could think Walmart uh, was an early an early adopter to this, so buying a line and picking up in the store, uh, but others have followed suit, and that is just that's just through the roof. And this general e-commerce has 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 kind of tripled over the last few months. And these data points are actually a few months old, so I can only imagine they the minimum held steady or have gone up. So things are moving more towards digital, and you know, some 
some companies were prepared for it, some weren't. Um, some companies were well positioned to begin with. So to give you a few examples, like I said, I work in the telco space and I've been on, you know, I've been on projects where we are supporting them with a digital transformation, meaning trying to get customers to purchase phones via their digital application. So their apps, you know, the website, et cetera. And typically that channel sees five, eight percent of most of their total sales. You know, most people buy phones in the store still. Um, and our goal was to help move it, you know, tick it up a few percentage points. And there's a lot of cost reduction implications to that. Um, you know, fast forward to COVID, and that was last year, those numbers. Fast forward to COVID, um, and it's now at, you know, 60%, 50%. So they've, you know, quadrupled their more than that, um, 10x their their channel shift in a matter of months and you know if you don't have the right tools and ai applications and you know digital digital constructs to do that uh, and platforms you're going to be left out and some some companies didn't some companies didn't have the right supply chain i think a good example of that would be ikea i don't know if you guys have experienced ikea here uh, a company that makes billions of dollars just hasn't done too well um they're set up for people to go in and their whole value proposition is that you go into the warehouse, you pick out your item and you go and they kind of eliminate some of the tires on the supply chain, which is great. Shift that over to digital and it's not working. And so they are not capturing as much as they possibly could. Um, companies that have done quite well, uh, well positioned, companies like Wayfair, furniture company online, super well positioned, have done quite well. Casper, which is a mattress company, have done really well. Uh, Ally Bank, which is a virtual, you know, fully online banking, has done really well, continues to do well. So there are some people that were winners, some that are losers, some that are playing catch up. But we all know that this has been a huge, a huge impact. Um, so with all that being said, I think the best way to learn about this stuff or to kind of humanize what AI in practice is, is going through a few use cases. Um, some of these I've personally been on, some of these I've heard through word of mouth, um, but I think it will help really paint the picture of what we mean when we talk about AI and AI in practice and what it looks like in businesses today. So tomorrow, if you want to walk over to your boss and say, hey, I want to start implementing AI more, here are you know, a couple ideas of what we could do and here's how you do it. This will help give you the, the footing or the starting point to do with. Um, and one of them, and this is seen at a lot of different companies, uh, I'll continue to use Telco as an example, just because that's what I'm familiar with. Uh, but that's what's called um, AI for care. So AI is part of the customer service environment. <clears throat> and so what you see here is there are opportunities to use AI um, to, to enable your customer service agents. So while they're talking to a customer, you have AI overlaid to kind of help service them or triage whatever problems are there. But also, and, and kind of more inviting is call deflection. So can you offload some of those kind of non-complex, simple uh, inquiries that customers call in for? Can you offload them to an AI bot or a smart bot or some type of AI assistant agent that can service the customer so that you can kind of free up your agents to do more value add or more complex activities? And if you can do that, there's a lot of benefits. So obviously there's an immediate benefit. There's an OPEX reduction, right? So cost per call will go down um, immediately, right? And, you know, obviously you can manage your workforce better, right? So, you know, when you have these surges, AI will support there. Think around holidays. Um, but the other one is, you know, increased customer experience, right? So if you're good at this and, you're, and you have the right algorithms, you're only gonna offer AI to the right customers. So kind of highly targeting your customers uh, to who would want to use AI and where would the AI experience be the best will help actually increase your customer experience. So instead of using a chat bot to just kind of, it's, you know, show that you have a chat bot. And sometimes I feel that way when I go on a website that it was a chat bot for a chat bot's sake. Um, you're actually using it in a targeted way that, 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 that helps the customer experience. So people that would wanna use a chatbot and engage with it instead of, you know, I don't know, my mother who is not technologi technologically advanced and a bot would just frustrate her, right? Um, and so as a result, if you can deflect, you know, you get enough call deflections, you really can make a dent in your OPEX and increase your margins. And so, you know, you see some of the shift happening where today 
you start off with AI, you get three to 5% of your different, you know, call leads going to it, uh, or intense, we call them. And you move that over to 40, 50% as you're kind of shifting fully into AI. It's impressive how quickly these tools can learn it. And so that's a big value driver that companies are, are starting to shift towards. So that's the first one. The next two kind of follow suit. You know, these are all kind of different flavors of each other, but I do want to talk about them separately. And this is AI for sales. Um, now, sales is an interesting one, and it's probably not the first place you'd want to go to when you're talking about AI because it's the lifeblood of, of a company, right? It's your revenue driver. It ties into how your company makes money. And the last thing people want to do is you lose a sale because your AI bot went, you know, provided the wrong response to an intent. There is influence in sales. Um, that being said, though, if you can use AI in a practical way, if you're smart with who you're targeting, if you can really understand the DNA of your customer, um, you can get to the right people who would be willing to use AI. Um, right? So let's continue. We're, we'll keep going with telco because, again, it's what I know. It may not be the right move to do AI on somebody that has a family plan, that wants to get four lines. They want international calling. They're maybe a little bit older. They're not technologically savvy. You've done some diagnostics on the individual and they haven't logged into their account once, or maybe they haven't logged in in six months. They have a Samsung, I don't know, X generation that's five years old. Um, these are all indicators that they're probably not the best AI candidate. But hey, what if you had a 26 year old um, they log into their account pretty monthly. They're part of your loyalty program. They're using the app, the loyalty app frequently. They're just one person on a phone. They seem to buy the iPhone at every iconic period that there is. So they're now buying the iPhone 12 Pro that they're going to. Well, man, that would be a great candidate to not plug up your stores and just offer them a sale and maybe some kind of specific AI driven sale uh, based on their needs that can get them to engage and pay early. So instead of them upgrading through the store where they're taking up a rep, there's a commission, there's a cost, a brick and mortar, et cetera, et cetera, you're using AI and you're off, offsetting the cost of a sale, increasing your margins again. And so you can do that for existing sales and then there's a play on new sales as well, although that gets more complicated. So that's another example of AI in sales uh, and quite an interesting one. The last one, again, another flavor, but we look at sales from the sales rep perspective uh, and think about, you know, particularly sales rep, at least at this stage, that have large, um, I don't know, we'll call them caseloads or leads that they have to manage. So think about inside sales, right? Um, or small, medium business sales. You know, so AI can, it can be used uh, to overlay. So kind of getting a virtual assistant, so to speak, that can provide next best actions, that can provide upsell, cross-sell recommendations, that can bring data from different locations to make a more omni-channel experience. So when you're talking to sales, you can start to find out if they went to a store, if they used online, if they talked to a customer representative, and start to bring that information in in real time to get information back uh, to the sales rep and give them the tools that they need so that they can, you know, they can close the sale and they can get the customer what they want when they want it. Um, and it also can be used to reduce all the administrative burden that can weigh down sales reps and keep them from doing what they should be doing, which is sales, right? They should be uh, doing everything they can to get in front of as many customers as they can and using AI to, to provide the, you know, administrative burden and push that down. So I've seen this start to pop up. Again, sales and AI, it gets people anxious. People don't want to play around with their sales dollars, right? Um, but as it's being developed, it's, it's really starting to take off and people are starting to see the value of AI in that respect. Okay. So we talked about a few examples, um, <clears throat> how AI can help drive revenue, drive, drive OPEX, OPEX reduction and margin expansion. Um, but how do you kind of, I mean, it, it, it sounds nice, but like where do you start, right? And how do you move from kind of proof of concept AI, where it kind of feels academic to strategic, actually kind of implementing, driving, and then strategically scaling? And how do you kind of make that shift? Um, 
And it really starts with the data, right? We know that data is the fuel of AI and, and data today, you know, as a, as a consultant, you kind of see various types of businesses. And there's a, there's a few reasons why data today, you know, in general has is, is, is been tough to manage and hasn't been the best to unleash the power of AI. And, and, and one of them is that, you know, data is kind of all over the place. It's, it's, it's dark, it's dirty, it's not set up properly. Um, and then the second reason is it's, it's siloed a lot. A lot of these, a lot of these companies have different data in different locations. And so the issues we see at different businesses across these kind of three paradigms is, you know, one, you got these siloed datas and these monolithic SAP systems or ERP systems that just aren't communicating with each other. Um, you do have these systems, you know, that are kind of large, they get these great warehouse, warehouse data, but they're not agile. They can't adjust and be flexible. So that's another issue that we're seeing. And the last one is just, and this is probably where I focus in on the most, given my position at Accenture, is around the cultural challenges with, with data and AI. Uh, we've talked about sales as an example, right? Like, you know, you talk about kind of influencing the customer and, 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 and sales, you know, sales representatives being able to have something that they can do that a computer can't, that, that runs deep and that runs across the organization. Um, and so to, to, to kind of kick off an AI project or just a digital project, even just analytic project, you really have to get these, these data systems in check. And, and there's a whole kind of field of work to do that. And that's happening in parallel as AI is being developed. And frankly, I think AI and concepts are moving faster than the data is able, able to harness it. But we have kind of a ton of data and we haven't figured out how to wrangle it correctly and quickly. And the companies that can do that are the ones that are winning. Um, but where where a lot of my work comes in is kind of how do you build the team? You know, if you want to go in tomorrow, how do you build the right team to get there? And there's a couple things, you know, at the bottom of the slide that that could help do that. So you know, one is having a strategic led, you know, individual or group of individuals that are strong in analytics, understand AI and the concepts and are able to start working with the business, working with the data to find opportunities in areas that AI or you know, more robust analytics could be used or machine learning, et cetera, to you know, whether it's increased revenue or reduce costs. And then they can actually point to it and size an opportunity. Say, hey, listen, if you, if you do this thing and we've seen it, like we've seen it out in the market, if you do this, we've, we've done some analysis and you have an opportunity to increase by X. You have an opportunity to kind of reduce costs by why. And, you know, if you want to get smart with it, you can do it over time. If you want to be more analytically robust, you could do things like A, B tests or even, you know, BA tests, et cetera. Um, but at the basic level, you could have a number and point to it and say, hey, here's the opportunity. And that really puts kind of things in perspective because when you bring that opportunity in front of people that say, like, you shouldn't do this, this is too, this is not us, this is, you know, the data's not there, you'd be like, okay. That's okay. So you're the one that's going to close out on this opportunity. So when I talk to our VP and say, hey, we have a $3 million opportunity by doing these things, I'm going to let them know that you said we couldn't do it for these three reasons. And that carries a lot more. And so that can help eliminate some of the blockers. So building those conversations up and setting them up is very powerful. But then you got to back it up because when they do say, yeah, let's do it, well, you need the right AI developers, you need the right data engineers, you need the right people to go out and start building those proof of concepts and to build them quickly. Um, and it doesn't need to be 100% perfect, it just needs to be built, right? So building these kind of tiger teams or, or SWAT teams, whatever you want to call them, um, is super important. And the last thing, and I'll, and I'll end on this, is about tracking. Um, we call it value realization or value capture. Um, so you said you're gonna get X, and now you're building it and it's out there, what did it do, right? Put your money where your mouth is. And if you wanna get fancy with it, put your name on it, man. Make, a, make a value-based deal saying, hey, I'm gonna commit that this is going to do this. And, this and, and, and you can pay me based off that. Now it gets a little bit into vendor management, et cetera. Um, but it's really important that you know, you're sizing an opportunity, you're building it, and then you're, 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 you're realizing the value, you're showing actually what it produced. So you can point to it after and say, we did it here. Why don't we go do it here? We did it in supply chain. Now let's go to HR. We did it in HR, let's go to sales. Let's go to care, et cetera, da, 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 da. 
Um, then that's it. That's my presentation. It looks like we're right at the 30 minute mark or close to it. And I believe there's a few minutes if anybody has any questions. And I'll stop there if the monitor's there. Am I okay with time? Uh, Eric, can you hear me? I can hear can you, you hear yes. Me? Great. I can Great. hear you. Yes, you are, you are very precise with time. Thank you for <laughs> very impressive Bravo. and uh, detailed speech. It, it was really amazing and fascinating. We, uh, I encourage participants to ask you questions in the chat. We don't have uh, them yet, so maybe you have something to add some extra slides, which I know in your <laughs> presentation. Uh, I don't. I mean, I, we can, all, I, I don't. I don't know how many people are on. How many people are in this uh, call? I don't see the list about how many i'm not sure i'm not sure i have this information right now because it's like organization okay. stuff which i don't have access to oh okay well i mean i would flip the question and ask the audience however, however many hello there is is you know they, they decided to join this call for some reason and probably didn't get a lot of background like so what, what do you want out of this what do you want out of this are you are you, are you here because you are working in ai and um you just want to kind of stay up to date. A friend invited you <laughs> or you're trying to get a job. And you thought like, as I enter these different, you know, events and I, you know, Hey, hey Eric, full, full up front, I'm trying to get a job at Accenture and I want to learn how to do that. I'm happy to talk about that. Or, Hey Eric, I work at different consulting firms or I work at this, like, how did you, how do you do these things? I'm, I'm totally help, happy to answer any of those questions as well. Okay, dear participants. Beyond that, uh, uh, yes, to, beyond, to, to, beyond to that, answer in the chat, I, I will read. I don't have any questions, but I, I would encourage you just just to be like, listen, I'm here because I want to learn X, and either you didn't tell me it, <laughs> so tell me it, or like I'm here because like straight up, I heard you work at NYU, and I you know I'm trying to get a master's, and like or and I want to get we a job. Have, we have a <laughs> question from uh, Lena. Uh, thank you for presentation. If we could imagine what could happen in 10, 20 plus years, what will happen with uh, artificial intelligence? Oh man. I mean, <laughs> that's the art of the possible. So yeah, you, you, you think about things like, there's a lot of kind of boilerplate uh, um, AI stuff that people talk about. A lot of people talk about fully automated vehicles. A lot of people talk about like, um robots doing surgery right and all those things i guess well, this is how i would frame it um i said i wouldn't talk about 5g but I, I would use 5g as a good use case so and this is public information you could look it up um let's use verizon verizon is partnering with aws and i don't know maybe a bunch of other folks who knows to accelerate 5g applications and a lot of those applications are ai based meaning like um, things around kind of, uh, sensor, sensor management, uh, other, a lot of things around automation in, in, in cars and vehicles and driving, et cetera. Um, but I think the future of AI really is going to ride on the wave of 5G. And you can think about 5G, like how 4G felt 10 years ago. So do you remember 4G 10 years ago where it's like, yeah, we're in 4G and everyone's like, I don't know, this feels like 3G. I don't really know the difference. Um, but then what happened? Like, think about all this stuff now, like how well GPS works. You're watching Netflix, you're streaming HD videos, you're using YouTube, all the, <coughs> you're doing Zoom calls on your phone, all the things that we kind of take for granted now that are kind of feel like table stakes. 10 years ago when 4G, like that was like the art of the possible. So like all we can think about is as 5G matures, AI is going to, and the, and the actual practical applications is gonna come with it. Um, but, you know, as far as kind of like the art of the possible, you know, I could only give you kind of boilerplate stuff. There's all these innovation labs and cool technology stuff that people can talk about and give you some more cool stuff. Thank you. Uh, the next question is from Irina. Irina is asking, what uh, would you suggest to start with uh, for people who just start learning what AI is and how to use it in work? Maybe some truthful resources to look at. Yeah, I'm going to stick to the 
practical word in my speech because that it's like okay I, I i watched this presentation from eric about ai for care like am i really going to walk up to someone and say we can do this oh i i i, I have a, a, a sign from a director that we have to stop here i'm no sorry problem. but uh, yes uh, we we didn't have time to uh, answer the question but uh, uh, I'll, I'll answer I I'll think... answer in two sentences. I'll, I'll answer in two sentences. Start with data. Start with data analytics. Don't even work. I don't know the maturity of the company you're in. My guess is it's not mature because most companies aren't. So focus on data and focus on analytics and how to drive value there. Start there.